name is Lauren Chavey. I'm Vice President of the Graduate Women in Science Organization, and I'm very excited to see you all here today. I'm also very excited to introduce our next speaker, Dr. David Hughes. Dr. Hughes has worked in 11 countries on five continents. He's currently working with an amazing system, zombie ants that are infected with parasites that are capable of influencing the behavior of their host. He earned his doctorate at the University of Oxford and completed his undergraduate work at the University of Glasgow. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Hughes. Well, good morning. So I'm the assistant professor here at Penn State, and one thing that commonly occurs for assistant professors is that we go across the country quite a lot to give talks in other institutions. It's something that we're quite often judged on. And so far this semester, I've been quite busy, and I've been to some really nice places. I went to give a talk at Harvard and Princeton and UPenn, and I also recently gave a talk at Texas A&M. And it was Texas A&M that I was most excited about because it's a land-grant school just like Penn State. And it was the first time I ever had the occasion to see another land-grant school. And so I was giving a talk there, and of course I was showing these beautiful images that we have in Old Main of the murals on the wall, which commemorate our history as a land-grant institution. And they, they show the, the, the details of the Morrill Act of 1862, how Old Main was erected, and erected in order to have an increased knowledge for agricultural and mechanical sciences. Texas A&M stands for Texas Agriculture and Mechanical. And Texas indeed is a, is a sea grant and a, an air grant, as well as a land grant school. And so there I was, I was talking to them, and recalled I had had many different talks this semester, and I even had two talks in Texas A&M. So I was a bit jaded, and I was a bit lost. And as you can tell by now, I'm not an American. I imagine there's some of you in the audience who are also not American. So you, you can be forgiven for forgetting past presidents. So there I was, trying to explain the Morrill Act to these people. And I was saying the Morrill Act was, of course, signed in 1862 during the Civil War by President, and it just didn't come to me. I couldn't get it. <laughs> and I, I knew who it was. It was President just didn't get it. And I said, you know that president, the one who is well renowned for killing vampires. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that got a laugh, and I think, and, and that's one of the things at that moment, and then on the way home, that's what I realized was beautiful about universities. Universities are places where you can bring together crazy things, crazy ideas and different situations. It is really a cradle of creativity. And in the case of Abraham Lincoln, he, is, he, is, he never actually met a vampire, apparently, so he wasn't actually a vampire slayer. But it's a kind of thing where you bring ideas which don't normally come together, but you bring them together. And that's very much what my work is about. I work on these zombie ants, as Lawrence talked about, and I've, th this is a, a, a compaction where you have a, a zombie phenomenon and you have ants. And for me, it really helps in telling the story of the system. And also, during this talk, I'm gonna talk about another um, another arrangement which is a bit unusual, which is bringing together the idea of famines with fields. We don't typically think of fields as sources of poverty and decay, and that's something that I've been really thinking about over the last couple of years, really driven by some, some, some uh, uh, inspiration that I gained here at Penn State. So this is the system that I, that I work on, that I spend a lot of time thinking about. And here, what you're looking at is an ant attached to a leaf on, in a rainforest, in this case, in southern Thailand. And the ant is well and truly dead. The only thing remaining of this ant is its cuticle. So the fungus has infected it maybe 10 days previous, and it has grown inside its body, and caused the ant to leave the nest and then bite onto the leaf. And so what you also see here is the fungus, which is growing out of the back of the head. You can see it also growing onto the leaf surface. And if you squint a little, you can also see a little spider, which has made its home under the body of this dead ant. This ant is well and truly gone. But the phenomenon of the zombie behavior comes into play when we, when we look at what happened before the ant died. We have a control of behavior, a manipulative process where the fungus really messes with the mind of the ant, making it go to the location, which is just ideal for fungal growth. It just happens to be on the underside of the leaf. And so, as Laura mentioned, I'm really fortunate that I've been able to work all over the world and have a global view. And so what I want to do is give you guys a sense of scale. So this is me standing on a rock in Thailand in, um, in a rainforest, a very beautiful rainforest in southern Thailand, the World UNESCO Heritage Site. This is me of the tree, about 60 feet of the tree, and just to my, to, to my, uh, over my left shoulder there's an ant colony, and down on the forest floor 
where Sandra is, is sitting on a log, that's a location where we would find these samples. So what we have is this enormous separation in space. And so we have to, of course, look at a rainforest, which is an awful lot of leaves, and we're looking for a particular ant. This is a, 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 a rock in a stream in China, in southern China, in Shishuan Bana, which is a tropical forest. And there, you're, now what you want to do yourselves is look and you find the ant attached to the leaf. And there it is there. So it's right up there in, 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 in the top. It's attached. So here the message is that the rainforest is absolutely festooned with leaves, as you can completely imagine. There's a lot of leaves in the rainforest. And so one thing which I, I find to be beautiful about the science that we do is quite often it challenges the change of perspectives. If you go into the forest, you can start to see the whole forest just from the perspective of the underside of the leaf. And that's the perspective which is valuable to the fungus because that's the perspective from where the fungus grows and where the fungus is directing these ants. But what then about famine fields? So zombie ants are nice in that they ask us to look at nature in a different way. We've heard a really beautiful talk by Peter this morning, Peter Hudson, where we talked about parasites and you know, we, we understand that half of life on Earth is parasitic. And so we're just looking at ways in which they can mess around with us. Of course, deadly ways such as the Ebola, but interesting ways in the case of fungi manipulating ant behavior. And so I started to work on these zombie ant phenomena uh, following this chap, Harry Evans, who was a, an extremely well-renowned plant pathologist. The reason I followed him is because in the 70s he done some really interesting work on, on these uh, fungi which control ant behavior. And then I contacted him, I started to work on him, and then I realized this was his side project. Most of what he did on a day-to-day -day basis over 40 and 50 years was working for a British government going across the world looking at plant diseases. This is a picture of Harry. In, uh, in, in Ghana, when we were working on cocoa, he's looking at a phytophthora infection on a cocoa pod. And so Harry was this enormous encyclopedic uh, knowledge of plant diseases. And so what would happen as we're working together from the zombie ants is we'd come out of a patch of forest. So this is the Atlantic rainforest in Brazil. It is the most highly decimated rainforest on the planet. 93% uh, of it is already gone. And so you'd come at this patch of forest up here, over there, and you would come onto a landscape of, in this case, coffee plantations. And you would say, this is very beautiful. They're all arranged in a very nice way. And then I would hear this, uh, this, this well-renowned expert on plant diseases talking about how it's all a disaster waiting to happen. And he would talk about how the British in the 1740s had coffee plantations in Sri Lanka, and it was all decimated in five years by diseases. And so he told these stories after stories about a landscape that is apparently beautiful and understandable. But once you know the biology, once you know the diseases, you can see that there quite often are disasters waiting to happen. I think this was a message that Peter Hudson made very beautifully this morning when talking about malaria and bushmeat, uh, the origin of HIV, and also the potential threat of such things as um, Ebola. And again, you look at a picture like this, agro-tourism in, in um, in Brazil, and you can say it's very beautiful, but taking an ecological view, you see that it's quite a disaster. And the same thing here in the case of cattle. And so these fields remind me of fields that I, I'm ex more experienced with. So I am Irish, and um, in Ireland, of course, we had this enormous famine in 1845. It was a, fu a fungal-like organism, which caused a complete decimation of the population. And that has scarred the environment. 160 years later, you can see these rows of lazy beds where we grew potatoes, you can see them still deeply embedded into the landscape because such was our population size that we focused so intently on the land we left these scars many, many years later. So I lived for a while in a place called Letta Frack in Connemara. Um, at the age of 15, I was kicked out of school, permanently excluded from school, and uh, I'd come from a poor background in Dublin and it was quite normal not to finish high school. I come from a family of six children and none of us ever got a high school education. And so it was normal, it was a complete, I, and I'm very happy about that experience, and it was a normal experience to take. And one of the things I did from that was go and work in the west of Ireland. And I worked on Connemara ponies. I lived in this place, which was a former industrial school set up by Quakers for poor Irish people, now a hostel. So I lived there, and I took tourists up into the hills, and I showed them these famine fields, and I told them stories of the Great Famine, and how we can still see the scars on the landscape many, many years later. And then it becomes slightly ironic now that I'm also doing this professionally. I'm talking about 
possible famine scenarios that we might see in other locations. And so the story that we had in Ireland was that we had a potato that came from South America. It was introduced first into the US and then into Canada, then right across the European continent in the 1840s, the 1830s, and then into Ireland, where we just thought this is a phenomenal food because potato is an enormously rich source of uh, 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 nutrients, and it grows extremely well. It's a very hardy crop. And that fueled our population growth to enormous levels. So in a very short period of time, we got up to 9 million people. And then the disease came along. The disease is called Phytophthora infestans. It was named by Anton de Barry um, a number of years after this discovery in Ireland. And it is, again, one of these contraction of name terms when you, when you bring it along. Phyto means plant. Um, it is, this is plant destroyer, tor as in destroyer. So this is a, is a destroyer of plants, but it's an infectious destroyer of plants. So Anton de Barry did a beautiful way of talking about organisms to really reinforce what they're doing. And this is exactly what it's doing. It's going into a population where we had everybody eating exactly the same crop, and it completely destroyed the landscape, and it just, just completely destroyed um, um, society, simply because of its ability to infect and move quickly. Peter made a beautiful point this morning about diseases of humans, but we also have to think of diseases of the food that humans need, which are plants, of course. And of course, this has left an enormous signature. Many, for, for, for American societies, in the 2000 census, over 40 million people identified themselves as being uh, Irish American, uh, because we had this massive emigration. In, in a very short period of time, we had five million people leaving, the, leaving our shores to go and populate the world, Britain, Canada, the US, and this has had an indelible mark. And so what I want to reinforce here is that we can see these massive marks on, on societies when something calamitous such as a famine comes along. So that was in 1847 to 1852, and around about that time, just a few years later, Penn State got going as a farmer school in 1855. This is a picture of Old Maine from 1859, and then in 1862, uh, Lincoln signed into, into law the Morrill Act. And so at that moment, there was knowledge about diseases, knowledge that could have stopped some of the calamitous situation. There was indeed, just before the famine, the discovery of the use of copper sulfate, which could be applied to the plant and actually reduce the infection completely. The knowledge was available. There was other things which are problematic, such as problems with trade, uh, uh, problems where we give a disproportionate advantage to certain groups in the world, for example, through trade loss, that was another issue. But generally, we had knowledge which could have sorted out our problem. And so when I think about the famine fields of Ireland, I also think now continuously about diseases in sub-Saharan Africa. This is cassava, a staple plant, also South American in origin, just like the potato. It came to, to Africa, been there for about 300 years, brought in by people. It has fueled enormous growth in population. In the early 70s, the disease has caught up. In the case of the potato, it was Phytophthora. In the case of cassava, it was a mite and a little insect which injected viruses into the plant. But the disease is caught up. And then, in a very short space of time, in four or five years, 250 million Africans in sub-Saharan Africa were in danger of losing their principal source of food. That was 80% of the population. 80% of the crop was lost, and it was affecting an enormous amount of the population. And so what happened? The international community mobilized we had a massive uh, investment. We had capitalized on the science that we already had available, and we found solutions. These were solutions were uh, uh, pests of that, of that um, uh, cassava mite and the mealy bug uh, which were brought in, and they saved the cassava plant. The cassava plant is now <coughs> saved, and people can grow in, in, and use it, and we still have that food security. But it is absolutely guaranteed that whether it's cassava or wheat in Africa or wheat in the mid-states of America, you will have a disease, and that disease will destroy the crop. And that will either destroy the crop of a commodity such as rubber or a staple such as wheat or potato or cassava. And when that happens, you're not dealing with a smaller population such as the one we found in Ireland. You're dealing with hundreds of millions of Africans, which are separated from Europe by 13 miles across the Mediterranean. The calamitous situation will be enormous. We've heard about the Arab Spring, we've heard about Rwanda conflicts in Darfur. Every single conflict that we have has its roots in food security, conflict over sources of food. 
So it is absolutely guaranteed that we will have such a situation again. And so what I think it then comes down to is the situation of quoting Lincoln or thinking about Lincoln, what he said. So he said that the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, we must think anew, we must act anew, we must disenthrall ourselves. He was speaking in 1862 when everything seemed pretty fine. We could have left the situation the way it was. We could think the situation is fine now because we're in a food secure nation. But it's not the case. We can have these things. And the principal word there is disenthrall. So I think you have to unlearn what you know. I think that's where students come in together. So what we're doing in our part was uh, working on this, this uh, social networking model with Marcel Salati here, who's a phenomenally uh, interesting and innovative scientist on social media. And we're trying to bring together the world's farmers globally through social media and cell phones in order to revolution that, that, that move with the knowledge. So we can't have a situation that we had previously where for the lack of knowledge we've had massive mortality.